Acts chapter 6, we're going to continue um, in our study of Acts, and we said that Acts is the beginning, or today we're going to look at the beginning of the deacon ministry, And but we said that Acts is that we are continuing the work of Jesus, and so that's the theme of the book of Acts, you will see that uh, throughout uh, today, though, we're going to be looking in on the beginning of the deacon ministry. This is uh, the very first place in the New Testament where we see deacons come to exist, come into existence, and what that uh, meant. So, this is an exciting passage, I think, in a lot of ways, because here you see the beginning of a new type of ministry, a new uh, a new office in the church that uh, God had uh, plans for, obviously. So I think you'll, you'll be excited as we study this passage and see how God designed this and uh, uses it for the upbuilding of the church and also for the ministry of the Word. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the fact I, I'll say this right out. We could easily turn this into probably two or three sermons. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm going to kind of give us a summary of this passage uh, this morning. But there's so much here that we could we could at least get two sermons out of this because there's so much to think about. This is anytime you run across the first mention of something in the Bible, there is a wealth of biblical knowledge and information that uh, is in that passage that informs the many other places after that that it is referred to. So, uh, if you will, Acts chapter 6, we're going to be looking in the first seven verses on that. All right? Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the, the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among, your, you, uh, from among you seven men of good report, full of spirit, and of the wisdom, full of the spirit, I'm sorry, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole co gathering or the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nick, or some will call this uh, Nicanor or Nick, Nicanor, whichever, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And so, let's pray together and ask God to guide us as we study. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the word of God. We pray that it would meet our needs and guide us uh, into all truth, that we might do ministry in a way that uh, upbuilds your church, that ministers to the congregation, and that, uh, Lord, reaches the lost, that the word of God might go forth and have free course and be glorified uh, in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we see first, uh, I, wanna, I just want to throw a little thing out here before I get started, because I meant to say this earlier about announcements. I just want to mention that, uh, and, and this is why this is so important, the, the um, young adult Bible study on Monday nights is starting a new study with David Platt. Uh, it's called Follow Me. That's, that's Monday night at 630 and it's a great time, the perfect time to get started in that. So I, I meant to mention that earlier and I forgot. So sorry about that. But um, if, in, in uh, Acts 6, verse 1, when you think about this passage, I want to lay a little bit of context for you. We want to remember 
that in this church situation, this is the early church, this is the church of Jerusalem, and we see that they have undergone massive growth. They have seen, of course, they've gone from 120 in the upper room to then the Pentecost sermon of Peter, which was, uh, we saw 3,000 men saved, not counting uh, women and children. So at this point, we're well over 3,000 members in the church. Then from there, we go just two more chapters, and we see Peter preaching again in Solomon's colonnade, and there we find over 5,000 people saved. So at this point, the church has gone from, you know, under a couple of hundred, 120 if we were to go by the strict number, to, but, the, we, but we don't know is that number just of the men. If it is, then if we count the wives and the children, the church was mu probably much larger. It might have been two to fifty. But either way, and it goes from, say, 200 to, to 3,200 or 3,300 members. Can you imagine? I was once, uh, and when I was in college, I was part of starting a church that went from 75 to 150 in one year. And you think, well, that's, that's not too bad. Well, when you experience it, it's, it, it is a whole lot more difficult than you realize. Uh, we went from, you know, having plenty of room to having to extend our worship area, I think another 50 feet, just to accommodate the extra 75 people. And by the time we had moved all the ground and built all the section and laid all the concrete and we're beginning our first service in that building after it was finished we voted to purchase another building because we had already filled the section that we just finished construction and so it you can see that a church that's growing rapidly can present a lot of different problems uh, we, we like to say they're good problems, praise the Lord, you know. They're better than the other problems, wouldn't you say, of declining and not growing. But, you know, we often think that if, we ha if the church is growing, then we're not going to have any issues, any problems. Uh, in fact, I heard a, a pastor or a preacher one time say, as long as the baptism waters are stirring... The congregation is busy serving the Lord and doesn't have time for complaining. Well, I don't know what, what he was thinking, and maybe that's his experience, but the, Acts chapter 6 does not give us that impression. We see a church that we would say, I don't even know how the apostles did this many baptisms. Can you imagine doing 3,000 baptisms? I mean, yikes. I mean, now granted, they would probably have, you know, multiple elders all doing baptisms at the same time or something like that. But, you know, I'd like to find out what it's like. Amen? That would be great. That would be great. But we see as we move into Acts chapter 6 that even though the church is growing at such a miraculous pace... It is experiencing some difficulties. Of course, we saw Ananias and Sapphira who, you know, wanted the prestige of giving uh, the full amount of the sale of their property when in fact they were lying and they only gave part of that. So we already see uh, there the pretension and the dishonesty has, has crept into the early church. We see here the differences of culture. And you can imagine if a church is a hundred or whatever, and they're pretty much from the same area, by and large, you're going to have a lot of similarity, wouldn't you? But what we have here in this passage, uh, it, it, to just kind of set it back in its context, if you remember in Acts chapter 2, a lot of the converts that were saved and were added to the church 
were not from Jerusalem. They were from throughout the Roman Empire. They were what's called the dispersion. Okay, the diaspora. These were Jews who for hundreds of years had been spread out through uh, parts of the known world. They're still Jewish. They attended the synagogues. Occasionally they would try to make it to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. But by and large, these people were Roman or Greek in culture. They weren't Jewish. In fact, when it says here that the Hellenist, the Hellenist arose, or your Bible might say Greek-speaking Jews, arose against the Hebrews, what we need to understand is that all of these were Jewish. Okay? Except for Nicholas, it says he was a proselyte of Alexandria there. So he was Greek, he had been uh, converted to Judaism, and then eventually to Christianity. But all of these people are Jewish. But the difference is, some were raised and were born and raised in Jerusalem. They spoke Hebrew. They lived Hebrew lifestyle. Okay, The rest of these people had come from the, the Roman Empire. They didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke Greek. They didn't really grow up with a Hebrew culture. They grew up with Greek culture and Roman culture. So now all of a sudden, they're all in the same church. Thousands of them. Now another thing that you have to keep in mind, and that's one of the things I'm going to do in this message, is help us to understand the context of what's going on here that will help us understand why the apostles created under the inspiration I believe by the leading of the Holy Spirit and Christ to create the ministry of the deacon okay because if we don't understand what's going on here then we don't understand why and what that ministry is all about so what's going on is the early church was primarily uh, poverty-stricken people. These were poor people. They were slaves. Many of them were widows. Back in those days, of course, you didn't have uh, you know, social security and retirement and these kinds of things. So if you were a widow and you didn't, maybe you didn't have a son or a relative, then you were destitute. You literally had, you know, women didn't have a whole lot of ways to make any money. And if you were an elderly widow, then you might not even be healthy enough to work. And so it depend, their welfare depended mostly upon their husband or their children or relatives who would take them in and take care of them. So this meant that there was a large amount of, po of the population that were orphans, orphans or were, were widows or... Uh, handicap in some way. We've seen that already. So there's a large amount of population here. There were no orphanages. There were no hospitals. There, there was no social security. There was no retirement. This was up to your family to take care of you. And if you did not have family that either cared or did not have it at all, then you were left to the mercy of other people. Well, of course, the church was always going about doing good for Christ. So they helped the poor, they helped uh, widows, they helped orphans, they gave them food, they preached the gospel. In fact, even in the gospel it says the poor have the gospel preached to them. And so what we find out, uh, both in James and in 1 Corinthians, we find out that the early church was primarily made up of the, you might say, the lower strata of society. They were poverty stricken. They had very little influence. They had very little money. Uh, there were a few, as we saw earlier, that might have owned land or whatever, and they sold that so that they could help those that were poor. Now, what am I getting at? I'm getting to the point that the early church took care of many, many widows. They not only fed them, but they probably gave them money. They took care of them, possibly even gave them places to live, these kinds of things. In that process, 
what happened is, of course, if you're, if you're over here ministering, and here's this group of widows that you grew up in Jerusalem. They are all from Jerusalem. And then here's a whole batch of widows that were from all over the Roman Empire. Would you have the, the tendency to give a little more care to the ones you know than the ones you don't know? Well, apparently that's what was happening. And so the Bible says here that the Greek or the Hellenist widows, the Greek-speaking widows said or murmured or complained that they were not, they were being neglected. And so uh, the disciple, this creates this situation. And I would say that we make a mistake if we assume that this was a small problem in the Jerusalem church. Acts is a historical book. If this problem was not significant, it would, it would not have been included in the narrative. So as we approach this account from a modern perspective, it may see, we may see that the solution would be impossible. We might, we might look at this and think, number one, it doesn't apply to us, or number two, that, well, this problem seemed to arise and disappear so easily. The church just, you know, well, choose out seven men. We'll create a new ministry. You guys take care of that. Don't read that in here like that at all. We need to understand this was a big deal. And Christ has called the church to be a place of refuge for the poor, for the needy, for widows, for orphans. That is a major part of our faith. So much so that James says when he talks about living faith and dead faith in James chapter 2 and in James chapter 1, at one point he says... Genuine religion is this. Those that visit widows and orphans and keeps their mouth from speaking evil. And so there is this in which an evidence of genuine Christianity is this desire to help those who need the most help. Those who are unable to to help themselves. Why? Because that's what God does. God has this great love. That's why God saves sinners. And the church is to mirror the love of God. How? By preaching the gospel to those that need to be saved. By ministering to the needs of the poor and the needy, widows, orphans, the abandoned, the sick, Another reason why the church ought to be at the forefront, I hate we didn't get a chance to watch this video, but we will show it next time, uh, that this video speaks, uh, that we were going to see this morning, of how the church, the early church, stepped up and cared for sick and dying people. And that was one of their methods of evangelism. And so, uh, which is something I brought out very early in this whole COVID-19 deal that throughout history the church of Jesus Christ has been on the forefront of medical care many many hospitals the very first hospital in western civilization was started by Christianity okay nursing nursing owes its existence to Christianity it was Florence Nightingale's faith in Jesus Christ that pressed her to walk into a place where she herself could die to take care of people. And so that's a whole other message. But to understand that this is how the church oftentimes mirrors the love of God. And that Christ came into the world among sinners, was rejected, was killed, murdered. Why? Not for himself, but for us. And so also the church of Jesus Christ goes into the world, oftentimes in danger, in one form or another, so that the world might be saved. So I want to give us six quick things that we pull out of this passage about 
uh, that will guide us in interpreting Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. The first one is that the leadership of the church was in touch with the needs of the body. The leadership of the church, don't get scared just because I said six, okay? I heard you. You're like, <gasps> nah, I'm just kidding. I'm playing. No, nah, I didn't hear that. You guys are very patient. But no, these are quick, you know, quick type, type points because what I wanted to do is summarize what this passage is, is talking about so that it really we're allowing it to speak for itself. That's, that's my whole goal. The, number one, the leadership of the church was in touch with the needs of the body. And we see that in verses 1 through 3 when we see that uh, it says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, they were growing. The church was massively growing. So this is an optimistic time. This is a joyful time. This is a time of celebration. But there arose a complaint by the Hellenists or the Greek-speaking Jews uh, believers, this is in the church, not the community, uh, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. This, the word distribution has the idea of tables where people would receive finance, financial help or food distribution. Okay, And the twelve summoned, the twelve is the apostles, the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom whom you will appoint whom we will appoint to do this or to do this duty. So the greater ministry was at stake. In fact, there's reason to believe that the that one of the reasons why these widows were being neglected is that the apostles were who were basically the acting pastors of the church. Okay, so the, the apostles here are essentially the pastors of the Jerusalem church. And they are trying to shoulder this all themselves. Their calling is to a prayer and the, and the propagation of the gospel, to preach the gospel, preach the word. But at the same time, we see, uh, as, as Barnabas and others, they bring the money in and they put it at the feet of the apostles. So somewhere in there, the apostles are also over the distribution of food and resources for the needs of the church. So these men are, quite honestly, they're probably just overloaded. And so something starts lacking. And, and so the disciples or the apostles here uh, they don't debate at all. They said, all right, we've got to keep preaching the gospel. We're, it is our calling to preach the word. So we need help. We need somebody to help us so that the word can continue to go forward. So he tells the, the congregation, the leadership of the church, he says, choose out seven men who are, uh, have a good reputation, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, and have and are also filled with wisdom. And we'll get to that in a second. So the leadership of the church was in touch with the needs of the congregation. There seems to be reason to believe that the problem was real and not simply perceived. The diplomacy that was used in this solution was a demonstration of leaders who were, as much as possible, in touch with the people and their needs. They weren't perfect. Notice these were apostles, and they weren't perfect. Okay? The best church has problems. Okay? Because, why? Because it's made up of sinners. All right? You got problems. I got problems. Guess what? The church has problems. Because we are the church. But here's the great thing Christ is the answer. And that's where we agree. We come together because we believe the gospel, we believe in the power of God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe the Word of God is God's inspired message to us. And therefore, God is the one who can solve our problems. God can sanctify us. He can forgive us of our sins. Give us eternal life. Give us the ability to live and to raise our families for the glory of God. To reach the lost and to make it to heaven. And so these are the, the things that, that God has done in us as the church. But we see here that the apostles were close 
to the need. They saw it and they admitted it. Okay, they didn't try to cover it up. They just said, all right, it, we need to keep preaching the word. So, and, and so there was this honesty. They were in touch with the need. There was an honesty about it. Number two, the congregation was respectful to the spiritual authority of its leaders. And of course, we talked last week about spiritual authority uh, in general. Here we see it in practice. I said last week how the church of Jesus Christ understands authority or should understand authority better than any organization on the planet. Why? Because we believe in the God of authority. The God who is the source of all authority. And so we see that demonstrated here. Notice that these Greek-speaking widows had a problem, and it does seem like it's legit. But they honored the spiritual authority of their leaders. They brought up the problem. The leaders dealt with the problem. And there's no more issue. And we're going to get to how they dealt with it. But there was not just a desire to complain. But there was an issue. And the issue was dealt with. And they respected the leaders and the solution that was there. If otherwise, something that, that we need not miss is that throughout this situation, the congregation, even the widows, are sensitive and submissive to the spiritual leadership of the elders and pastors. There was apparently only the desire to solve the issue, not to be divisive in the body. There was not a desire to be divisive in the body, but a, a, only a desire for the situation to be rectified. And I would say this, that we have to be careful about that. Sometimes in church life, that's what we, we kind of want to fuss for attention or, or whatever. And we have to allow the Spirit of God to discern our motives about this. We can go to the book of Exodus, we can go to the early church and the book of Acts, and we can see that God doesn't deal with that stuff lightly. Too many times in church life, we, we treat compl a complaining spirit as if that's not a big deal. Well, God doesn't treat it that way. God treats it as a very big deal. Okay? And so... But what we see here is that there's a legitimate issue. The, issue. the issue is brought to the leaders. There is respect for spiritual authority. The spiritual authorities come up with a solution that it's clearly spirit-led. And they institute that involving the congregation in the solution. And God, we're going to see God blesses that. Thirdly, we see the pastors were better served, uh, better serve the congregation through prayer and preaching the Word. Now this is important, not just because uh, of the nature of the position, but also because of the nature of the position of a deacon. Okay, so I'm going to get to that quickly, but, but to understand that we see in verse 2 through 4, the apostles said, it's not right, or it's not fitting. They weren't, Excuse me, they weren't complaining, you know, it's not right for us to, you know, they weren't saying that they were too good for something. This was, an, it's, this was a clarifying of calling, a clarifying of the mission of the church, quite honestly. The apostles were sent by Christ, the, we might say at this point they're the pastors, they were the teachers, the pastor teachers. It was their calling to be men of prayer and men of the Word. The Word of God to be preached and taught and expounded, to seek opportunities, to, to, to evangelize and preach the gospel to the lost. And what the apostles are saying is, guys, we can't stop preaching the gospel. We can't stop expounding and, and declaring the Word of God. We can't take away ourselves from the ministry of prayer. And I love how John, uh, John Dick, the Puritan writer, said this. He said, this is not just uh, talking about their daily devotions. Okay, Every Christian is supposed to pray, not just the pastors. No, he's, he's, they're saying here that if you preach the Word, you need to labor in prayer for the success of the Word. You don't just preach the Word and hope that, that, well, that's that. We're all done with that. No, you preach the Word 
And before you preach it, and after you preach it, you ask that the Spirit of God would make it work and, and, and be energetic in the lives of, the, of His people, of His congregation. And so there's this laboring in the Word and laboring in prayer that must go with the ministry of the Word, which is what they refer to. We will give ourselves to the ministry of the Word and prayer. Or prayer and the ministry of the Word. Okay? And those go together. The ministry of the Word is what I'm doing right now. Okay? And it's many forms. You might say the DCCC uh, college group that I talk, that I do through Zoom meetings um, on Tuesday mornings. Uh, that's still preaching the Word, even though it's very conversational. You know, I'm just... We're, we're opening the Bible and, and they can ask questions and I'm kind of walking through the book of John with them. That's still expounding the Word, preaching the Word, this kind of thing. But that's, that's, that ministry, this, this is what I want us to understand and this is what the apostles wanted us to get. That is the primary ministry of the church. This is why the church is the pillar and ground of the truth that Paul says in the pastoral epistles. This is where people ought to know they can come and hear God's Word. And so it is vital that, that this not be lost in other noble and good ministries that ought to be going on that are subservient to the ministry of the Word. And so we need to keep that clearly in front of us. And the, the, we see here that the pastors of the church better serve the congregation through prayer and preaching the Word. And that, that is still the case. G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher uh, of the 19th century, pastored Westminster Church in London, preached all over the United States. He wrote a whole book on this, The Minister of the Word. And the whole book is essentially Acts chapter 6. And he's talking about how ministers, preachers, pastors need to prioritize preaching the Word. That they should not let themselves get overwhelmed with so many other good things, okay? Nobody's kicking visiting or, or caregiving or administration. All those things are necessary. But this calling must be primary. That is the calling Years ago, and most of us have grown up in the, in the South, you remember when a man used to be called, that's what they would say, he's been called to preach. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about? There's a sense in which, I mean, there's one sense and you think, well, you know, a pastor does a lot more than just preach. You know, you counsel, you administrate, you got, and all that. But at the same time, there's a sense in which I like that term. Because if a man can't preach the Word, I'm not so sure he's doing anybody a whole lot of good. Because that's his calling. That's his primary function. And so that's why that's so important. All right? Number four. Godly men are obvious if the congregation is willing to see them. Godly men are obvious if the congregation is willing to see them. I said, well, pastor, what do you mean by that? I'm going to get there, okay? The leaders of the church were able to trust the spiritual discernment of the congregation. They knew that these people would not play favorites or politics, but would choose godly, humble, uh, responsible men for this important ministry of caregiving and compassion for the congregation. Okay? You say, well, how do I know that? Well, think about it. What did it say? The apostles said, choose from among you. Notice the apostles did not choose them. They told the, the church, choose from among you seven men who are have a good reputation, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and filled with wisdom. And these men were chosen. Now something you might not recognize, which also speaks to the legitimacy of the situation... Every one of these deacons have a Greek name. Now what does that tell you? These Greek-speaking widows 
we're telling the truth. There was a problem. And when these men were chosen to help the widows in the church, they chose Greek-speaking men who would care for the Greek-speaking widows. So some of this may have been a language barrier. Okay, no ill motives, but clearly a problem. And so, but I want you to see that the church knew who these men should be. And I want to tell you, in my experience in, in pastoring over the years, the church knows. They know the men who are godly. They know the men who take their Christian walk seriously. They know the men who are filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It's nothing mystical or weird. It means that they love God's Word and they live a godly life and they seek to be faithful to Christ. That's what that means. And they have wisdom. They make good decisions and they're helpful in ministry. They know how to take care of things well. It's what this is very, very clear. These are not mystical terms. These are terms of, of wise men who have a good testimony in the congregation and who have exhibited that they have a vibrant faith in Jesus Christ and in His Word. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And my experience is people know who those men are. Now sometimes the, the church can get caught up in politics. And so so-and-so maybe doesn't have a good testimony. So-and-so does not exhibit a godly Christian life. But so-and-so has a lot of money. Or is big in the town. Or these kinds of things. And you see, that is fleshly. That is not godly. That is not what makes a deacon a deacon. Or a church leader a church leader. That's the wrong reason to be choosing somebody. He says here that they were, had a good testimony in the congregation. It's, and notice that the Greek-speaking widows who had the problem had no problem with these men. Why? Because these men all had great testimonies. Okay? They knew that the problem was going to be solved with these men at the helm. Why? Because they knew the men. They knew they were godly. They knew they had a good reputation. They knew they were wise and they made good decisions. You see, that's the thing that's going on here. And I say that churches need to understand that it's not a popularity contest. It's, it is us following Christ. It's not political. It's not popularity. It's not money. It's none of that. It's what, look at the credentials. And you say, well, what are they? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. A deacon, likewise, must be dignified. That means, it doesn't mean they've got to be rich or wear a suit. What it, what it means is they have a soberness about them. They're clear-headed. They're serious about the world and spiritual things. That's all dignified means. They must be dignified, not double-tongued. In other words, they're not uh, backstabbers and liars. They're not addicted to wine or much wine. In other words, they're not alcoholics, not greedy, uh, for dishonest gain. They don't steal. Uh, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That's in other words, they must be saved and not living in sin. Okay? And let them also be tested first. In other words, they don't get saved one day and then they're a deacon the next day. They need to be mature in the faith a little bit. You know, they need some time to grow up in the Lord. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. That mean, doesn't mean, blameless doesn't mean they're perfect. It means that they have a consistent godly testimony. They're not living in open sin. Okay? They're not denying the faith in any way or denying God's word in any way. Let deacons each be a husband of one wife. Can I just say this right here? I'm not trying to throw bombs or create controversy. But it is very clear, just like I said before, uh, uh, the, John Dick, the great scholar, uh, and, and Puritan scholars said it last I was just reading it last night he said this means men in Acts chapter 6 notice it says choose out from among you seven men First Timothy the deacons must likewise be husband of one wife 
Okay? Husband. Now, if you're a woman and you can be a husband, which these days you never know, maybe you self-identify as a husband. I don't know. Now, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? The Scripture is clear. The spiritual leadership of the church is male. Why? Because the spiritual leadership of the home is male. Now, that doesn't mean that men win every argument. It means men need to carry the ball. That's what it means. This is not God giving men privileges. This is God holding men accountable. That's what this is. This is God saying, I gave you this, now you step up and lead. That's what this is. Okay? So ladies, don't take this as, you know, well, God, God's favoring men and giving them all the privileges. And No. God is saying, men, I'm going to hold you accountable. How's your home? How are you leading my church? Men are to be shepherds, not dictators, not tyrants. Shepherds, loving and caring and protecting those in their life. Women, children, loved ones, the church of Christ. That is our calling as men. That is the use of masculinity. Masculinity is not toxic. Okay? That's what the world wants to tell us. Masculinity is God-given, just like femininity is God-given. Okay? God has certain things that women can do that men just quite honestly can't do. It. Okay, ladies, you can amen that. Amen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's wonderful, isn't it? Why can we not celebrate the creating design of God rather than resist it? God has given ladies something incredibly wonderful. Children love daddy. But they love, love, love mommy. You know? Why? Because moms, women have an extra something that God has given them. Which is, in my opinion, part of their femininity. And men have been given this masculinity. Why? So we can be proud and arrogant and force our way on everybody? No. So that we can be courageous and hardworking. So that we can be providers and protectors of those who cannot protect themselves or provide for themselves oftentimes. Not always. I know there's plenty of, young, uh, of single mothers out there that have to do both. And, and, you know, but that's not the way it ought to be. It's not the way God intends it to be. We live in a broken world. Those ladies should not have to carry both, both of those weights. And so we shouldn't act like that's normal. We should act like that God wants something better for that situation. And I know that's a whole other subject, but I want us to understand. The Bible is clear here. This whole debate over women deacons and women pastors, it's settled. Okay? It's been settled for 2,000 years. That's not new. It's only new to modern people who want to change the Bible. Okay? So, this is not the case. It is not teaching this. It is clear that the credentials of the deacon ministry are for men. Okay? So are the ones for pastors. They're for men. And that's because God has called men to lead the way. And He's going to hold us accountable if we have not been spiritual leaders in our homes, to our wives, to our children, to our church. He's going to hold us accountable for that. So it's not some big privilege. It, it, is, it is something that ought to cause us to be very patient, to be loving, to be kind, to be self-sacrificial. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Christ died for the church and husbands are to love their wives in the same way. They are willing to give their life for their wife. That's what Paul says in Ephesians. So this is a great depth of love, not tyranny, not, not uh, uh, of abuse or privilege, but it's one of protection, provision of love and sacrifice. Lastly, the new, the new ministry of deacon was also connected to the ministry of the Word. I want to 
want to stop here. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse said this. He called the deacon ministry organized compassion. Organized compassion. Here's what I want us to make sure we understand. So the deacon ministry here is created in order to lighten the load so that the, uh, the apostles who were the acting pastors can continue to pray and to teach and preach the word. And so these deacons, these seven men, are able to care for widows and, and homeless and sick and so forth. They pr take care of financial needs of, of others. Uh, I know a lot of times in our deacons meetings, you know, Jimmy gives us a report on benevolence. And, you know, here's what we've given out. We've helped three people. We've helped five people. You know, these kinds of things. And, you know, this is what we're talking about. That, that's the kind of thing that, that is there to lighten the load. To, to build more of a team rather than just one person carrying, carrying the load. And then the work doesn't get done. But what I want us to see, because we may miss this, we may say, well, yeah, the deacons are there to, to just take care of all the extra stuff. That's not the case. Notice that this is a support ministry to the preaching of the Word. The whole point of this ministry is so that the preaching of the Word continues. I don't know if... I hope you see that. That was my whole point in trying to do this, this expound this passage in this way so that we could allow this situation and the Scriptures to show us why this ministry came into existence. And I, I can tell you this, that there is no other place in, in, in the history of the world where in a religious group where a ministry like the deacons came into existence. Christianity is the place where this ministry came into existence. And the, the difference it has made is insurmountable. Organized compassion. The church decided to figure, we have to take care of our loved ones in the body. And we need to know how to do that. That was the, the institution of the, de, the, word, the, the ministry of deacons. And of course you all know the, the Greek word diakonos, where we get our English word deacon, it means servant. Now, it doesn't mean that they just do whatever. It, it meant that they serve the tables. They administrate. It's an, it's an administration term. It's a term that, just like he said, the, dis, the daily distribution. The Greek word means tables. Tables where uh, the many widows or others might come to receive financial help, food, direction, care. They were administrators. This was a church of 10,000. It didn't mean that the deacons did every single thing. It meant that the deacons oversaw. And they made sure that the, these people were cared for. That they got what they needed. This was a, it's, it's an administration term. And when we put it into its context and we understand what it means. I know that's probably not the most exciting sermon you've ever heard. Uh, but I hope that it will help you and me to understand the way that Christ's church is supposed to run. We are in a day when church has, in many ways, just turned into an entertainment industry. We've got churches that are just putting on a show every week. And quite honestly, that's not Christianity. And that's not worship. The church, as you can see here, is very functional, very practical. It understands the will of Christ and the Word of God, and it gets busy doing that. Reaching the lost, caring for those in need, and worshiping God truly and biblically. And that's what we ought to be about. And so what happens when the church does that? Well, look with me in verse 7. And the Word of God, and this is why I say this, the deacon ministry is intimately connected to the ministry of the Word, just like the pastors. And the Word of God continued to increase... And the number of the disciples multiplied 
greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests, the priests became obedient to the faith. What happened here? So rather than the ministry of the word diminishing because the apostles had to make sure that this situation got fixed, the deacons went to work, did the things that the church needed, and the word of God continued to get to increase and go into places where it had not. So in other words, the lost became, you know, were saved. The, the gospel was preached. The church continued to grow. The needs were met. Why? Because God was glorified and the work was done properly. This is God's church working together to do the things that Christ has called it to do. And that's what we have to do when God calls us. To be humble, to seek God, and follow His leading according to His will.